The Ryzen 3 3300X was available on Newegg a couple weeks ago and sold out in two hours. But I got one. Let's see if it was worth it. Hey guys, welcome to Elevated Systems. As always, I'm your host CJ, and today I'm gonna build a PC that you unfortunately can't build. Not because it's a super special system or overly complicated to build, it's just like every other PC I've built on this channel. No, you can't build it because at the time of filming this, 1 July 2020, you probably can't get your hands on most of these parts. They're either sold out or unavailable or just marked up to ridiculous prices. In fact, the only component here that you can probably find right now is the Trident Z Neo memory. And that's the one component that isn't very practical for this build. I'd actually recommend a less expensive kit for this build. It's kind of a crappy time to be building a new PC. So why am I doing it? Well, while this is a solid and affordable build, that in the future, which I don't know, maybe it's the future right now as you're watching this weeks or months after I upload it, maybe it's something you might consider. However, today, my goal is to follow up on my video from a few weeks ago and put this Ryzen 3 3300X up against this Intel i3-10100 in a similarly specced, priced, and practical gaming PC and see how it performs in comparison. Pretty much identical to how I compared the i3-9100F and the Ryzen 5 1600AF systems. That was a pretty popular video, so I figured I'd do it again. I'll put links to those videos in the description below. So a real quick overview of the build. First, of course, is the CPU, which again is the Ryzen 3 3300X, a four core eight thread CPU with a 3.8 gigahertz base clock and a 4.3 gigahertz boost clock. Now, the 3300X does come with a Wraith Stealth cooler. However, I won't be using that today. I'm going with the inexpensive but capable Cooler Master Hyper 212 Evo, but with this Noctua Redux 1700 RPM fan, only because the Cooler Master stock fan died. I also made a couple mods to increase performance and its looks a little because, you know, that's what I do. Now, some of you might know that with the i3-10100, I just used the stock cooler, which is true. However, that's a locked chip on a locked motherboard and its frequency and power is limited, so it doesn't matter. It doesn't have the thermal velocity boost like the higher end 10th gen CPUs. So you can put it under a custom loop and it'll perform exactly the same as with the stock cooler. This CPU, however, is unlocked. So the cooler you're able to keep it the higher and longer it will boost its frequencies to a limit. And I'm not even gonna overclock this. I'm just gonna let the motherboard do it. I'll show you in the BIOS a bit later, but this $30 cooler will probably allow the CPU to boost to its max boost clock on all cores, probably indefinitely, we'll see. On to the memory, and I'm using this two by eight gigabyte kit of G-Skilled Trident Z Neo DDR4 3600 megahertz CL16. Now this kit costs almost as much as the CPU, so I'll leave links to kits that will perform the same but cost closer to the $70 range. Like I said, I'm using this because it's the only 3600 megahertz kit I have. This is actually the kit that I'll be using in my personal gaming PC when I build it uh, one day. The motherboard is the MSI B450 Tomahawk non-max version. I've used this before on the channel, and like I said, due to the popularity of the max version of this board, I was able to get this one for 80 bucks. And yes, Ryzen 3000 runs just fine on the non-max boards. Even if you get one with older BIOS, it still has the BIOS flashback, so you can update it without an older CPU. It'll also work with the 3600 megahertz memory with no problems. Now, I'm using my Corsair CX750M 80 plus bronze semi-modular power supply because I put my 600 watt EVGA PSU in my son's new gaming PC, and well, 
power supplies are just too expensive to replace right now. The rest of the components are exactly the same ones I used for the i3-10100 build. The Gigabyte Radeon RX 5700 Gaming OC 8 gig for graphics and the Sabrent Rocket 256 gigabyte NVMe M.2 SSD for the boot drive. And I'll be putting it all in my Be Quiet Pure Base 500DX again, so we have some apples to apples comparisons of the thermals. Well, that's it. Let's get into build mode. Okay guys, that build went pretty quickly. Like I said, it's not a complicated build, but I'll be honest, I booted up the system to get the video capture through my main system set up and the case fans weren't spinning. I forgot to connect them. See, even semi pros make mistakes sometimes. But now I wanna show you the simple bio settings I'm using to test this system. So. Okay, now on your first boot, you'll get this screen that says your configuration has changed. Uh, to hit F1 to run setup, so we'll hit F1. That should take us right into our BIOS. Okay, from here, I'm going to just go ahead and go straight into my overclocking section. And the first thing I want to do, of course, is come down here to my XMP profile and select profile 2. And that should set, right there, our frequency to 3600, right there, 3600 megahertz with our correct timings. So now the only other thing I want to do is come up here to Game Boost and enable it. Now, this should boost all cores to their max all core frequency automatically. And I have the latest BIOS and the latest chipset drivers installed, so I think with the 3300X, our voltages should be okay. Game Boost had a tendency to drive core voltages too high. If that's the case, I'll just come back here and set a override mode or an offset mode for the core voltage to compensate if the motherboard pushes them too high. Now, this is just a very simple way to overclock your CPU. For someone that's a beginner to it, However, if you have the experience or are familiar with dialing in an overclock by gradually adjusting core frequency and voltages, by all means, have at it. Okay, I just wanna save and exit. Okay, I forgot another thing that Game Boost does is runs your CPU fans at full speed. You can go back into BIOS and correct that too.
So let's see here, just as, well, it looks like I'm running all, at all core 4.4 gigahertz and voltages are 1.35. That's not, that's not bad. It's definitely not maxing out. Okay, that's it. Now there's a slew of gaming benchmarks for me to run. That'll take me a better part of the night, but for you, it'll be fade out. We'll start with the 1080p results. And first up is a quick review of the results from the Intel i3-10100 system I'll be comparing this system to. And a reminder that these results are not representative of best possible performance for these CPUs, but rather how the two systems with similar specifications and price point perform. It's a PC review, not a CPU review. More on that later. Let's bring in the 1080p results for the 3300X system. Here we see our average FPS and 1% lows as well as the FPS difference compared to the i3-10100 systems. Differences annotated in black indicate results within the margin of error and are essentially a wash, while the differences annotated in green indicate gains. And well, there are no red numbers on this chart which should speak for itself. Basically, what we see is that titles that are more CPU dependent such as CSGO, Ghost Recon, Overwatch, Jedi Fallen Order, Shadow of the Tomb Raider, and Borderlands 3 had significant increases in their average FPS, 1% lows, or both in most cases, while titles like Apex Legends and Control which lean more on the GPU didn't see measurable gains, understandable considering the same GPU was used in both systems. Now moving on to the 1440p results, here were the results from the Intel system. And now the Ryzen system, and we see much less separation in our average FPS as at this resolution we are much more GPU bound. However, we still see some significant improvements in 1% lows as the 3300X was able to maintain better and more consistent frame times. To wrap this up, let's look at the average of the nine titles tested. Here we can clearly see that at 1080p resolution, the Ryzen CPU really shows its strength with a difference in average frame rates of 9% and a 17% improvement in 1% lows. And while both systems were GPU limited at 1440p, keeping average frame rates within the margin of error, there was still a plus 13% difference in the 1% lows on the 3300X system, translating into much smoother gameplay. So, conclusion time. But first, let me try to head off some of the questions or criticisms I'm sure to get. As I mentioned, this is not a strict CPU review. There are specific testing processes that remove all possible bottlenecks from the CPU and allow it to show its absolute best possible performance. And this typically involves a $3,000 plus test bench with the top of the line motherboard, 32 or more gigabytes of maximum speed and lowest latency memory, and an RTX 20 Ti. That's a bit above the weight class of elevated systems at this point in the channel's young life. Guys like the Steve's Hardware Unbox Steve and Gamers Nexus Steve, Paul's Hardware, Bitwit Kyle, and others do an awesome job at that. I build and tinker with computers. I've been doing it since I borrowed my uncle's soldering iron and replaced a blown capacitor on my Commodore 64 when I was about 10 years old. And typically, I strive to build systems that hit a specific price point and are well balanced in both performance and component cost, meaning I'm typically not gonna put something like a $500 RTX 2070 Super in with a $130 3300X. Now, considering the benchmarks I just showed, this 3300X will probably scale well with a 2070 Super, but still, the price disparity makes it not the best choice. If you're gonna spend 500 plus on a GPU, you could probably afford another at least 50 bucks to get a Ryzen 5 3600 or even a 10700K. Also, like I mentioned in the beginning, I normally wouldn't recommend 
this $114 memory kit when you can get a 3600 megahertz kit for closer to $70. I ultimately intend to pair this kit with a Ryzen 3700X. Balance. Next point, unlike a strict CPU review, I'm not running a clean Windows install with every possible background process shut down. It's a very mature and constantly updated Windows install with all the typical background processes running like the anti-malware service, there's some Adobe processes because Photoshop is installed, Mystic Light service. Because while I do know some guys who shut down everything they can to squeeze every possible frame out of their systems, most people don't. I mean, do you shut down your RGB while gaming if you spent the money for the RGB? Also, on the other side of that note, I don't intentionally run programs or processes that I know many gamers do, like a Discord chat or a music app or even Chrome. If you do that, then you're pretty aware of the typical performance hit it takes on the system. I can't test every possible scenario. And finally, I don't test streaming, and I wouldn't recommend streaming with a four core CPU unless you're using hardware encoding, specifically NVIDIA's new NVENC encoder. Now, I'll revisit these systems and test some streaming when I'm able to get my hands on an EVGA RTX 2060 KO because I refuse to pay more than $300 for a graphics card with only six gigabytes of VRAM in 2020. Balance. Anyway, stay tuned for that. But now that you had a bit of my PC philosophy, let's get on with the conclusion. If I'm building a gaming PC in the $750 to $800 price range, normal price range, not today price range, and I'm looking at one of these two CPUs, which one do I choose? Well, forgive me for saying, but this one seems like a no brainer. You saw the data, the 3300X is clearly the better CPU. AMD has finally surpassed Intel's IPC, and while at the high end, Intel has significantly higher frequencies, here at the low end, frequencies are about equal, but the Ryzen part is unlocked and capable of overclocking past the locked Intel part with just a single click in the BIOS. And if you want, you can push the CPU even farther. You can watch lots of other reviews. They all pretty much say the same thing, especially if you want to do more with your PC than game, like some content creation, and you just can't afford a six or eight core CPU, then this CPU pulls even farther ahead. But I said it seems like a no brainer. The reality is you can't buy this CPU right now. I got lucky and just happened to jump on it in less than two hours before it sold out. I wanted to pair it with an affordable B550 motherboard, Apparently those don't exist, not out in the wild at least, despite having being launched two months ago. And B450 boards, well, good luck. It's hit or miss on those too. This CPU you can buy right now and at a fair price, and you can buy an affordable B460 motherboard to go with it. And it's not just about demand, it's actually more about supply. I talked to a product manager of a large electronics retailer that'll remain nameless just a day or two before the launch of both the 10th gen Intel chips and the Ryzen 3100 and 3300X. I asked him about anticipated stock and he told me that they'd have plenty of the 10th gen Intel parts on the day they launched, but that I may be able to find a handful of the Ryzen parts online, but he didn't actually expect to get any for a few months when they were actually released to retailers. Those are his words. So that's it. It's not that AMD put a large quantities of these out there and they just sold out quickly. AMD only put a handful of these into the wild just so they could say it wasn't a paper launch, but it was a paper launch. Now, again, I only have info from one retail source, not from AMD themselves, so take it for what it's worth. So while this is the better performing CPU, this one is actually available, and again, it comes down to balance. I tested both these parts at 1080p max graphic preset. You can always tweak individual visual settings in your specific games to find a good balance of visuals and fast but consistent performance on even this Intel CPU. Anyway, that's it for this one, guys. Let me know what you think of the build in the comments below. I'm curious which system you would build and why. Again, thanks for joining me. Be sure to do all 
that stuff down there, and I hope to see you in the next one.